Well, a very warm welcome to another vlog. And uh, this time around, it's all about macro photography. Um, July and August here in Ireland have probably been the wettest on record. July certainly was. And with that rain also came um, a lot of wind. And I had planned to spend the summer indulging in uh, macro photography, um, but I had limited opportunities to do so in the field. So uh, I thought I'd take the opportunity today to sit down and to collate and share um, some of the information that I've gathered and the lessons learned uh, over the last couple of years. So let's start with the basics around macro photography and the terminology involved. Uh, the word macro is derived from the Greek macros, uh, meaning large. Um, Nikon calls its macro lenses micro, meaning small. Um, actually, both words are incorrect when it comes to describing macro photography because a macro lens gives us one-to-one -one magnification. That's the same as your subject, um, rather than larger or smaller. But all of this terminology is largely irrelevant because macro photography is about capturing and sharing images uh, about the beauty of a world that's largely uh, unseen by the human eye. So let's have a look at some of the equipment, particularly the lenses involved in trying to capture this micro world. Um, I have a selection of lenses uh, that I have been through with regards to macro and uh, let me just take a few moments to walk through each um, to discuss the qualities of each lens. Um, so first up is a lens that is not a macro lens and that really is a key consideration. Do you need a dedicated one-to-one -one macro lens for macro photography and the plain answer is no. Uh, this is a 135mm um, Zeiss APO Sonar uh, lens. Um, I use it for landscape photography, but it's f2 aperture and it's dreamy bokeh. Really separates any insects such as butterflies or dragonflies from the environment around it. And that's a key part of macro. We're usually de dealing with very busy environments, leaves and brambles uh, behind a butterfly or dragonfly or insect. So having a lens like this that, that delivers it, uh, that dreamy out of focus area, out of the box is, is, is an absolute bonus. So let's move on to another option, uh, which is pairing a something like a 50 mil lens. And that focal length works very well, 40, 50, 60 mil with extension tubes. An extension tube is basically a barrel, no glass in it at all. Um, it decreases the light getting through, but it increases the distance between the lens and the sensor, therefore magnifying um, the subject. Now, the 50mm lens, um, particularly a good prime 50mm lens like this Sigma Art uh, 1.4, lets loads of light in. So that counters the lack of or the reduction in light from the extension tube. Now, if we can get the lens very close to the subject, such as a small fly, we can get beautiful dreamy bokeh in the background. Um, and the ISO is still going to be very low, ensuring that there's very little grain in the image. So this is a very viable option. And I'll put one image of a fly um, that I encountered and it's dead still for me. And it took three or four shots um, I stacked in Photoshop um, to get this image. So let's move on to those dedicated uh, macro lenses at one-to-one uh, -one magnification. Um, I have three of them here. The first is a Nikon 60mm uh, lens. Lovely size, nice and light, um, built of metal though. And it is an old lens, readily available on the second-hand market, razor sharp. Uh, traditionally used for photographing coins and stamps, but it really is sharp. I've taken some nice uh, portraits of my dogs um, with this lens and it really is a super, super lens. I don't use it too much, but what the 60mm gives us is a, a very close focusing distance. Lenses. This is a 105 um, dedicated macro lens, um, a Nikkor MC 105 at 2.8. And this is the standard. 
this is the the gold standard as such with regards to photographers going for macro lens they'll tend to pick a 105 and it really is a good focal lens and i've been using this predominantly this year and the color contrast is quite muted in it but it's beautiful it's lovely reproduction of real life color uh, razor sharp uh, image so that's the nikkor 105 now sometimes we run into a problem when approaching dragonflies or butterflies when they can be a little bit flighty so we want to keep their distance and to help us do that um, we can use a longer focal length this is a 200 f4 nikon dedicated macro one-to-one -one lens beautiful lens um, most work in macro is manual focus um, it just the autofocus even on the modern systems still struggles so uh, i switch the camera always to manual and uh, this particular lens is fantastic for that focal wheel look at that buttery smooth and just the tiniest movement just the focus just a tad um, so it really is superb macro lens um, again available on the second hand market Nikon don't produce these anymore it's an old lens they haven't updated it and I'm not sure whether they will um, it has a very rich color um, contrast in the lens um, but nonetheless it is razor razor sharp a beautiful lens uh, to use um, it's just I haven't been using it this year because I, I got the 105 essentially and um, I mean you get a new toy it's nice to use it so those three dedicated macro lens are fine for one-to-one -one macro in other words real life size but if we want to go into true macro or higher magnification we need to go above one-to-one -one. so there's two tools that I've acquired this year uh, to enable me to do this the first one is a little screw on piece of glass which is essentially what it is it's microscopic glass made by Raynox it's the Raynox 250 and I was really surprised at the quality of this little piece of glass so it simply screws onto the top or onto the front of your macro lens or any other lens I needed to do a stop down filter for it to screw on here and um, it gets us closer um, so images that we see online of uh, a dragonfly's eyes um, and the color and detail in those compound eyes that's feasible only with something like the Raynox or a higher magnification it's not really feasible with the 105 on its own um, so that is what I've been working on predominantly this year um, in spite of the rain and the wind which makes it nigh on impossible to to photograph um, you know insects that are moving at all the Raynox gives us about uh, 2.5 ma magnification that's 2.5 to 1 when paired with the 105 so um, it really is invaluable and with this little bit of kit that's uh, very affordable um, you enter a new world so we can see with our eyes the dragonflies butterflies flies but we can't see beyond that and when you put this lens on and or when you put this piece of glass on and move towards a subject the hairs on the flies legs or the spiders legs the eyes the color in the eyes that's the world we're entering in a world that we really can't readily see uh, with our bare eye so let's take it up another step uh, this is a lawa a uh, 25 mil ultra macro lens and this takes us from two and a half uh, by magnification two and a half to one to five to one Canon have a very similar lens to this the 65 uh, mil lens uh, but Nikon don't do anything um, like that um, the front you'd, you'd be fooled for thinking the lens is in here but it's actually at this end um, and there it is I hope that's clearly visible just that tiny piece of glass using this lens is a real challenge a technical challenge and um, you need very calm conditions you need the flight to stay still for a while or the subject to stay still for a good while and you need to take multiple images because the focal plane is razor slim 
For example, if we were to take a photograph of a fly, and I'll put an image up there. Uh, I took a fly just over here in my garden on some yarrow. And I think that was six or seven images. And that was just to get really the front of the fly in focus. That's at F6, F5.6, as far as I can remember. So they're the lenses that can be used to help us create uh, images um, of arthropods and flowers, lichens, um, etc. Now recently, um, in the little wildflower garden I have down um, at the end of the garden here, um, I found a caterpillar. It turned out to be the caterpillar of a comet butterfly. Um, the caterpillar was about to curl up and go into the chrysalis state. Um, and I managed to capture a nice photograph uh, of uh, the caterpillar. The next morning I got up and the chrysalis was there, totally transformed, a real miracle. And I was delighted. It's great to get a thrill when you spot something like that and you see such a transformation overnight. So the next image I'll put up is of the chrysalis. Now I am waiting for that chrysalis uh, to, for the butterfly to emerge for the chrysalis. It can take up to 10 days and I'm just crossing my fingers that I'll be around uh, the house uh, when that transformation happens. The standard time for a comma butterfly to emerge from the chrysalis is seven to 10 days. This is the 19th day and I've been so lucky just to pop down this morning and find the butterfly had just emerged and it has flown just a few inches onto some bindweed here. You'll see in the background the empty chrysalis and this it really is what macro photography is all about, to see a living miracle absolute gem. But if you're new to macro photography and you're considering buying a lens, maybe start out with some extension tubes. Um, it's a type of photography that you'll either love or hate. It takes a lot of dedication, kneeling down in bogs, um, getting bitten alive by midges and horseflies. Um, so it's definitely not for the everyday photographer. Uh, nonetheless, and from only from time to time, you'll bring home an image uh, that uh, you're proud of. So they're the lenses. Next, let's address the subject of managing light. Now, I doubt there is another photographic genre that uh, requires such careful management of light as macro does. And as the magnification to our subject increases to capture more detail, um, the light decreases. So we have a number of options to manage light and um, it's just basic photography with regards to the management of ISO, shutter speed and aperture. But for macro photography there are a few considerations. And I think first and foremost is the background and how we present the subject um, within the frame. As I've mentioned, the background in macro photography amongst bushes and reeds and so forth tends to be very busy and sometimes overpowers the subject itself, which can be quite subtle in its coloration and its shape and its lighting. Um, so using a very open aperture um, to let lots of light in and reduce the uh, focal plane um, is desirable. But on the other hand, doing that um, means that we will have to take multiple images at different focal planes and stitch them together in Photoshop. And that presents challenges with regards to the weather, ensuring that it's very calm, um, that um, the insect stays still. And that's where uh, going out very early in the morning is essential if we want to capture those beautiful images. And early in the morning, insects, as I've mentioned in a previous blog, are in a torpid state. So therefore, they are unlikely to move and you have a willing subject for a few minutes or maybe longer. So therefore, we can open up the lens, have a beautiful bokeh 
and have a, a subject that's going to stay still for us on a calm morning when that happens. So that's the ideal um, uh, situation that we want to find ourselves in with regards to uh, management of light. Now, from time to time, the light on an overcast day, for instance, or when we, uh, the, when we use higher magnification lenses in a forested area, for instance, the light is just very, very poor. It's very dim. So to counter that, we can uh, select a flash uh, gun to provide additional light. Now, using artificial light um, is never a preferable approach. Um, the natural light that the insect is uh, presented to you within is always preferable. It always looks better. Um, but where the uh, level of light is so low that you've no option but to use a flash, uh, then use a flash. But it's important to pick the right flash or to use the flash in the correct way. Diffused light, so this is a Quangrang Twin Light uh, KX800 and it has two lights which means we can actually using these bendy arms move our light sources to wherever we want it. Uh, we can adjust the power of the flash and preferably use the lowest power possible uh, coupled with an ISO that's acceptable to you and depending on the magnification use as open an aperture as possible. Um, so the most important aspect of the flash is the diffuser. So there's a little diffuser here on the left flash and on the right flash here. There's a little modeling lamp which helps us focus uh, at the front and um, for very dark situations over very small subjects. And that's really it. The use of the flash should be a second port of call above using um, natural light. Well, the light's fading here. It's after eight o'clock, early September, and so too really is the season for macro photography concerning uh, flying insects and flowering plants. So I continued my exploration of um, comparing artificial light, light with the Quangram uh, KX800. And just opening up and pushing the ISO up and using natural light. I'm uh, siding towards using natural light, as you would expect. I have found that using the flash uh, in the middle of the day provides lovely fill light for butterflies. And I'll put one image of a peacock that I took using flashlight uh, on hemp. So maybe next year I'll take the uh, new flash out again earlier in the season and uh, we can uh, explore a little more and uh, my mind may be changed then. Um, so uh, I hope you've enjoyed the vlog. Um, next time I am going to travel down to Wexford and to Compton Lake to photograph wading birds. I'm really looking forward to it and I hope you'll join me then. If you enjoy the content, uh, please think about subscribing to the channel or drop me a comment. Um, so until next time, thanks for watching.